Greeting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm David Morton, a Change Management Project Officer within the Improvement Service and I'm also the Lead Facilitator of the Scottish Change Managers Network, which this, uh, which this webinar series is, uh, is a deliverable of. Uh, today our speaker will be Gavin McGregor, Head of People and Transformation at North Ayrshire Council. Uh, who's going to talk through their Chi Sigma approach. Just quickly before we begin, we'll just go through the housekeeping. You should have a small grey box on your screen with a question and a chat box um, as part of it. If you have any sort of, if you have any questions for Gavin throughout the course of the webinar, then please post these in here, and we'll get uh, get to them at the question and answer section at the end. Also, if there's any any issues with uh, either the audio or the display throughout the webinar, then please use this question box uh, to highlight them. Finally, we'll have a short follow-up survey just to go through the webinar quality and information and also look at future speakers for the webinars and how we can improve the series. So we'd be delighted if you could uh, participate in this following, following the webinar. Um, that covers everything for me, so I'll hand over to Gavin and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you. Okay, thanks David. Um, good morning everyone from sunny Irvine, or at least it was yesterday anyway. Um, my plan today is to tell you the story at North Ayrshire about our approach to lean, and we call that Chi Sigma, and I'll go on to explain more about, uh, about why we do that in a wee bit. Uh, this is my first webinar, and not being au fait with webinar etiquette, I have a coffee at my side, so if you hear the occasional slurping noise, then please don't be alarmed. Anyway, in doing this webinar, I'm making the bold assumption that most, if probably not all of you, know at least a fair bit about Lean Six Sigma in terms of the overall process. So I don't intend to teach granny to suck eggs, uh, particularly as the key thing for us here at North Ayrshire was not just about the methodology of the process we used, although that was absolutely important, but it was really about how we engaged and involved staff in creating change. In my own view, that really is the secret sauce that makes things like Lean work really well. Okay, so uh, as David says, feel free to ask any questions, heckle or argue. I expect that from some of you I've worked with before, so whatever, I'm happy to, to interact. In terms of uh, Kai Sagunaga's approach, you're probably wondering what that's all about, but um, the Japanese speakers amongst you will probably already know that Kai is literally Japanese for good change, or alternatively, it's good change through people, and that was really key to our approach, so that's why we kind of branded it as such. I suppose Sigma gives just a hint that we're actually using a structured and robust method. So essentially it's a hybrid approach of using lean with our people and it also at pace. Um, throughout our change projects we try and keep a quick pace on things using agile project techniques. When I initially discussed using lean with our uh, CMT leadership team and the chief executive here, Elmer Murray, I think there was really broad agreement that this should be an investment in our staff and not external consultant led really a focus on staff involvement and freeing up ideas for improvement. Um, I, I came to North Ayrshire uh, in 2012 and around that time our employee engagement survey showed pretty low scores for staff perceptions of involvement and change. Uh, only about 50.3% agreed that they felt involved in change that affected their roles. So we wanted to do something about that. Um, another of our key aims was really to accelerate collaborative cross-service working. That was about moving people out of organizational silos to work more closely. And I think um, using peer challenge is a great way of asking why things are done in a service. And sometimes it is about asking those difficult questions to gently challenge ways of working. Elma, who's uh, our chief executive, she's also signaled as an organization that we needed to step up a gear with regards to the pace of change, so this was a practical chance to do something about this as well as really involving staff in creating the change. It's my contention that both Aristotle and Banarama are leadership gurus of their time, and I think that although they lived over 2,000 years apart, that both Aristotle and Banarama essentially had the same leadership message. Uh, the Banarama one was probably more uh, exciting for a teenage boy in the early 1980s. But the, the key point or message for me is that both of these leadership gurus, I say, stress the importance of how you do things as opposed to just doing things. And you may now be indeed be humming that tune of the ain't what you do, it's the way you do it, and that's what get results. And I'm afraid that tune will now be in your head for days probably. Anyway, no doubt many of you will probably have read Aristotle's seminal book on Nicomachean ethics. And basically he was saying the same thing as Banana Rama that he got in there first by a few thousand years. In his book, uh, he stresses the important difference of people with technical knowledge or expertise, 
or as Aristotle puts it, the Greek idea of episteme, as against phronesis, which is about effectiveness through wisdom and experience. So to me, what Aristotle was basically saying was, you may well be a clever sword, but are useless in real life, and that you really need people around you with nous or savvy. So as well as having clever people with great technical knowledge, you need to make sure that you big up on people with phronesis or wisdom. And this may be familiar to some of you in that the most clever or expert people in an organization who have massive brain power but no real common sense or savvy. So you really need a mix of both clever and practical people. So if you have knowledge and savvy, you're on to a winner. Uh, I bet you never thought you'd get such highbrow stuff as Aristotle when you dialed into a Lean Improvement webinar. Okay, uh, I'm going to take you through what we call a Chi Sigma project cycle in some of the key stages. And in essence, our approach is really meant to be a blend of that knowledge and expertise in having the right training and tools, but it's really also about engaging people into this and trusting, empowering them to work together and be creative and innovative. Each of our cohorts is based around an agile approach of a 12-week fixed period. We use the full day make lean cycle throughout with the clock ticking throughout until we have a, what we call a final day of success presentation when each of the teams present results. We start off with a kickoff meeting when all of the staff who have undertaken the Greenbelt training come together to discuss ideas and prepare a pitch themselves. We then quickly move into a pitch day session and that's where staff peer select themselves the prime the final projects uh, in, by peer challenge. In the last two cohorts, we have roughly about 17 total pitches each time, which the teams themselves whittle down to the final six or seven that we can handle corporately. The next key stage is when Elma, as chief executive, is involved and staff do a very simple overview of their one-page improvement charters in a presentation. And we try to keep that open, it can be as creative as they want when they do that, so we don't really just fix them to, to PowerPoints or whatever they want to do. Each Agile project is then underway and the clock is ticking on a 12-week timeline and it's already fixed with Elma's diary that at the end of that 12 weeks that she's booked in for the day of success so the teams then go through the full day make cycle of lean. What we also try to do, and it's pretty key to our approach we think, is provide expert coaching assistance in lean for teams to draw on and act as a bridge between classroom theory and business practice. It all varies how they use that, some of them use it intensely, some of them less so, but it's there to really give them that support when they come out of the Greenbelt training that they're using the analytical tools for the first time. We also provide support through an individual member of our change team being allocated to each project as well as a senior leadership sponsor to help clear the road for them to get things done. Throughout the Chi Sigma cycles, we've learned from our mistakes and the feedback that we have from teams uh, and we now have a midway review point which we call a toll gate review and that's for each of the sponsors come to the, the senior leadership team with the chief exec to update them with how the project's going and I would say that motivates them to take a keen interest, shall we say. The final stage is the day of success presentations to both our chief exec, uh, to our chief exec and the senior leadership team using a market stall tour format. So all of our senior leaders are, are actively involved in this and come and see what the teams have been up to. This slide is really just to give you a very simple overview of uh, an improvement charter and what we do in order to keep momentum and maximum engagement, we try to keep governance structures and paperwork simple and proportionate because we want to keep the levels of enthusiasm and energy high as possible but really focus the time on delivery, not just about governance paperwork. We've also tried to keep this approach throughout our work and change with appropriate but focused governance but really pushing on accountability for delivery. What this outline shows, it's actually been changed in sense, this is, this is an older example, is our one page improvement charter template and that gives a real summary of what the project's about and why we're doing it and I think if you can't get thinking right to explain the project in a page then it's likely to be problematic. So for us, keeping it simple really helps a lot. So the project on the page is presented to Elmer's chief executive by each team at the start of the Chi Sigma cycle. This is uh, uh, the scoring metrics that the teams um, peer pitch on, just to give them a sort of uh, simple mechanism to, to whittle down the, the projects, and they rank projects using this uh, down to the capacity that we can actually support. And as I say, we've changed this over time and in the light of the experience, and, and particularly because I made a boo-boo right at the start. Um, we had one fantastic pitch from Children's Service uh, that didn't make the final selection, as the benefits were mainly reputational or more soft benefits, 
Um, so as we've got more experience, we've had to change and refine things. So feedback and um, wash up days, as we call them, is a, is a big part of learning from where we've got things wrong. I really like this cartoon because it, it gets across that point that it's not just about process bureaucracy, but it should be about engaging and evolving staff and change. And it's for me, it's about don't choke the goodwill through making this a paper trail of bureaucracy. The balance is really to try and keep pace, buy-in and enjoyment. And for me, it should be challenging and tight time frame, but it should also be enjoyable. And hopefully you get that word of mouth effect where success breeds success and people want to do this. We've actually had uh, you know, things I've, I've been quite amazed by in terms of employees coming off their holidays to do that pitch to Elmer's chief executive. And I'm talking about frontline staff who've never done formal presentations before. So it's something quite new. Um, I've used Lean in throughout uh, my career in private and public sector organisations with varying degrees of success, to be honest. Um, but I now firmly believe that staff engagement, involvement in Lean should be right at the heart of the approach. My role uh, in Kai Segment North Ayrshire now is really minimal other than providing space and support for staff to do great things themselves. And I think by doing that, they will always achieve more than you ever expect. The point of this photo is really to represent that our approach to Lean Through Kai Sigma is about getting people to work together that you might not necessarily expect to be working together to achieve a common goal. Uh, and you're probably wondering that that cat and dog look a bit stretched, but uh, that's because I couldn't scale this photo properly. They're not actually like a Sochi's cat or dog. Right, okay, the, the structure of the, the, the Agile approach around the 12 weeks, so we very deliberately use that structure to keep that focus on pace and delivery, uh, but in doing so, we do recognise that people are still really busy and day jobs spinning the plates to keep the day-to-day -day operations running, but what we have found is that having a specific deadline with staff, knowing that in 12 weeks time the chief executive is going to be in front of them, actually is a real incentive, shall we say, or I'd describe as a positive pressure. Using an agile approach for us is about bringing pace but also structure to how we deliver change. At the start of doing this, they, they, I have to be honest, there were very mixed views about the challenge of doing lean projects as well as a busy day job within a 12 week period, but in balance, staff now strongly support this uh, and we've given the signal as a senior management team to support to that, to try and help clear the road a bit so that staff have the capacity and some time for improvement work, otherwise they would be in that catch 22 of spending their day to day time soaked up on cumbersome processes. This, this cartoon is really about getting the, the why we use Agile in North Ayrshire. And for me, it's not waiting endlessly for perfection, but you can deliver real customer value in chunks or sprints. And that's really about a good enough approach to delivery. So as the slide shows, instead of a long wait until the car is built, there's value for the customer is delivered through a series of iterative improvements that give the customer something that they can actually practically use. So instead of waiting years to build a cathedral of perfection, the idea for us is to build a bungalow, then another bungalow, then another one through a series of improvements that deliver value over time. And this is pretty much, I, I think, how Apple do product update, updates um, through a series of agile approaches, particularly with iPhone. They have a, a new version of the iPhone planned every few years. Um, and you can hopefully see from this slide, you know, the evolution of the iPhone, that uh, Apple deliberately have that series of releases with a short time cycle between them and adding in some new refinement or functionality. And I think that Apple call this approach uh, their TikTok approach, so it's quick releases with that gradual refinement and changes as new models are released constantly. So it's not waiting to perfection, they actually purposely do a quick release with some new uh, additions. Um, the accountants in our organisation uh, seem to like this graph uh, in that it compares the delivery cycle of an agile approach to traditional project management or waterfall, you know, your full prints to uh, techniques. Um, what this shows to, to, uh, to me is that there's a far quicker return on investment by chunking projects down to a series of quick wins. I know it says dollars on this example, but it's the same principle. I mean, how often have you been involved personally in long-term formal projects with scope drift, delay, and delivery all of us over the next hill. Of course, there will still be many projects where they do require that form of waterfall approach, but I think for many change uh, projects, uh, particularly in local government, an agile approach can really work and speed delivery cycles up. 
Okay, what I, what I plan to do now is take you through some of the specific lean projects, one in particular that we've worked on here, and give you a bit more of the detail that, that sits behind it so you can see how we approach that. One of the very first uh, Chi Sigma projects we worked on um, a couple of years ago was the OT equipment store. And obviously this area is a political hot topic given the connection with delayed hospital discharges. Uh, Scottish governments have made this a, a huge priority and invested a lot of money over the next few years to reduce the volume of delayed discharges and that focus of ensuring people can return to their home with uh, care and support that they need. So provision of occupational therapy aids and adaptations are a critical part of this care and support. So in North Ayrshire, just to give you the context, um, a number of issues had arisen over the years which were presenting a, a huge challenge for that uh, service. They, they were experiencing a very significant increase in demand for the service. Um, over the two years up to 2014, it increased by over 48% in demand. And also with the national population trends indicating that would only get worse. There was also an increase in the range of equipment being distributed from the service, but combined with the reduction in staffing within the OT store. So they only were down to one technician and one storekeeper. So what could possibly go wrong? Increased demand, complexity and less resources. Well the answer was that there was increasing customer dissatisfaction with the quality of the service and consequently the reputational risk to North Ayrshire Council. It was, it was therefore important to us that uh, we should fix the process to not only ensure it was fit for purpose but make it fit for the future. Rapid access to uh, appropriate equipment and low level adaptations are essential to the service uh, and in the North Ayrshire, uh, the OTs within Health and Social Care Partnership, well, they started to meet locally as well with uh, the other Ayrshire authorities. And uh, during these forums, it was really highlighted there was a comparably poor delivery service from North Ayrshire store. And that was really different from the service in South and East. So there was uh, an increasing lack of confidence in our service. So for this process to work, it's critical that the equipment is delivered early in the process. And this wasn't happening and resulted in referrals being processed to, to other OT staff. So that slide really gives you the, the nuts and bolts of the, the, the problem. In, in summary, the service was poor and customer perception was sliding. They weren't being updated about things. But sometimes I think it's useful to move away from just metrics around the process to, to look at the impact on individual service users. And I want to very quickly share a story with you that the, the team captured at that time about the impact of this. I'll just uh, run you through this. Harry is a 14-year-old boy who has cerebral palsy as a, and is wheelchair dependent. He lives with his mum and dad in a two-level house. The property has a stair lift and tracking hoist system in his bedroom upstairs. His dad works away from home and therefore Harry is mainly cared for by his mum. Mum was experiencing difficulty with transfers downstairs when he returned home from school. A hoist was identified from store, however this took four weeks to be delivered. This resulted in Harry's mum struggling to cope and she requested home care. A significant amount of time was required contacting the store and mum. The hoist was finally delivered and one of the staff spent time with the mum supporting her through this, but Harry was quite distressed throughout the process. So that story gives you a flavour of what this meant in reality to, to service users on the ground. So in, in order to do something about that, we undertook the OT equipment store review. The team started by defining the problem, which was massive, and so it's difficult to understand where to start and what to focus on. What helped the team throughout was the voice of the customer, and having that voice as king throughout the project was invaluable. There were extensive discussions with the OTs to gain an understanding of what was critical to both the internal customers and the end user customers. The team uh, used various tools to help define the problem and give them a structure to work with to start to narrow down the focus of the project. The team used tools including an affinity diagram to start to make sense of the myriad of information, but also working up a SIPOC um, diagram, suppliers, inputs, process, outputs, customers, etc., so that we were able to gain insights to the current state. Also defining what was in and out of frame of the project pr proved to be very useful. The problems at the equipment store were so large to be fixed to in, in one go with the available resources and the time given, we really had to have a focus on what was doable. And in the end, the team had more out of scope than was actually in. 
But what was in scope was having the biggest impact on that service being provided and what mattered most to the customers. Having worked through the various lean tools, what resulted was a tight definition of the problem and why it was so important to our customers. And a shared understanding of what we were tackling across the team was important. The team was actually made up of uh, green belts from right across the council, with reps from education, building services and finance, as well as uh, within social services. So the team was starting from a very low level in terms of knowledge and understanding about the process. This meant that in some ways the start was quite slow, but ultimately it was a real strength. Importantly, there was independent challenge and clear thinking. There were a few times when someone would ask, why do you do that, which brought everyone up short, but it was really simple and effective. The moment of truth came when the existing OT store staff began to see for themselves how many roadblocks they created in the system. For example, there was a high number of process steps involved in making phone calls to customers to arrange for stock delivery, and this resulted in many waiting points or lookbacks within the system. The geography of the process also merged with staff working across two rooms, and this seemed to build in further complication. The moment of truth initially led to discomfort, particularly among the store staff, and they felt a bit embarrassed and anxious about what would the obvious need to change would mean for them personally. Uh, the project team worked with the store's management to provide reassurance about the positive impact that the changes would have on customers and on the reputation of the store's team. And importantly, they were also reminded of the important role they would have in coming up with and testing the solution. The need to uh, keep the team working constructively and positively led them to prioritise the importance of having regular team meetings. At the end of each important stage, a review was held. And this ensured that all members of the team were informed of the progress of the project today and also gave opportunity for challenge and reflection and gained agreement from everyone that it was okay to move on to the next stage. These meetings were held initially on a fortnightly basis but latterly became weekly and then moved to daily sessions. And this was a, obviously a significant time investment for everyone but it was considered invaluable and staff referred to them as storyboard meetings. So next the team went down to the store and started reviewing the processed orders. They took a random sample. You can see some of the, the photographs here that tracking this is just the, the, the sheets they use in the wall to, to lay out the process. So they took a random sample of 102 orders that had been processed and looked at the performance. Next they ran some analysis looking at the time taken for orders to be processed. It wasn't a very sophisticated analysis, but it was a very stark result. The performance was clearly unacceptable. But being able to put real figures to the performance was a key moment of truth for the team and senior managers. And they realized for the first time just how bad it was. The target for completing orders was a couple of days. But what the sample showed was one request was on, only one request was completed in that time. And the majority were far, far longer, with the average of 34 and a half days. As you can imagine what some of the outliers were with the average at 34 and a half. I think this was the key point in the work where the team really started to unify. The guys in the store were, I think, expecting the blame game to start. But when the team kept focused on the process and how to improve it, they weren't distracted by looking for who was at fault. However, they also realized that to meet customer expectations and to build trust in the service, they would also need to add steps in that were not there before to ensure the customer would be informed and communicated with throughout the handling of their referral. By investing time in getting this right, they were, able, they were able to reduce the need for waiting time and remove lookbacks in the system. So they managed to eliminate 27 steps from the 57 stage process and actually got it down to 13 right first time steps. There were no additional steps required at decision points. The control phase of our DMAIC journey was one of the most rewarding and that was because the ideas came from the store staff themselves. They invented a bug board as they described it. And these boards were used to record issues with the new processes they arose and encourage staff to propose solutions to resolve the is these issues. These bug boards, and I've got a slide I'll show you in a wee minute, were displayed in the open office so that all of the team could contribute to that. A performance display board was also served to track the outputs of the team each day, and there was a daily team huddle was introduced first thing every morning and the last thing in the afternoon to plan for the day ahead and also reflect on the day just gone, deal with any issues, and importantly, celebrate performance. Excuse me. During the two-week data gathering period, the new process achieved an overall reduction in delivery lead times of 33 days, 
down from an average of 34 and a half days to just one and a half days. Uh, the control phase of the project continued beyond the 12-week period with the production of a handover plan and procedures manual to accompany the new process. And that's just a, a photograph of the, the, the bug boards that the staff used each day. So in terms of results, there's a slide showing a summary of the results metrics from the OT project. But going back to the story of individuals such as Harry, I sort of want to use a flip side story from another case after the done improvements. <coughs> me. Mrs. Jones, who was 43 years old, was in hospital with a diagnosis of advanced motor neuron disease. The assessment by the hospital staff was that she required admission to care. Mrs. Jones wasn't able to communicate clearly, but could indicate her wishes and her family wanted her to return home. The hospital was uh, a bit resistant to this, however the social worker and OT staff worked to identify the equipment needs and care package. A bed, hoisting equipment, showering and toileting equipment were, were requested as a priority. This equipment was delivered within 24 hours and the lady returned home with a care package. She's delighted to be at home now with her budgies, her TV and her family visit on a regular basis. So as well as the need for quantifiable improvement metrics around lean projects, I think it's also really important to consider and reflect on what the softer benefits might have been. As in the case of the OT equipment store uh, project, these were equally as important, I would say. And that was around reputational gains, such as improved trust and confidence in the service, but also the feedback from customers about the scale of the improvement. And that was a real significant morale booster for staff, especially as they'd come from a situation which must have been pretty frustrating and downheartening. OK, at the end of each 12 week, 12 week uh, Chi Sigma project cycle, we build in what we call a day of success. Uh, and this really acts as the results delivery point, but it's meant to be fun again. And you can see there some of the photos from the day of success. It's very much staff led, uh, but it involves Elmer's chief executive and the whole of the CMT senior leadership team on a market stall tour. And staff are free to present results however and creatively as they want. We just let them do what they want to do. Uh, and we've seen a complete variety of ways that they've got across how they've done the project and the results, including a Benny Hill style video. And uh, one thing I particularly enjoyed was the full cinema experience with that Pearl and Dean theme song, Popcorn in the Works. But it's getting across the uh, important message in a bit of a fun way. So we do try to make it a bit of fun, but we are serious about making an impact with results. Um, Elmer's chief exec is really core to making this approach work as many of the staff involved have never met her before or done any type of formal presentation. So having Elmer's commitment as chief exec I think is really key to all of us. In case you were wondering uh, the reason why in the slide it seemed knocking Elmer's socks off, in the evening before the day of success we did a, a quick run through with the teams and I asked the group when they got together, what is it you actually want to achieve tomorrow? Uh, and someone piped up that they wanted to knock Elmer's socks off with the results and impact. So that was it. We're kind of stuck with it now and it set the standard. And here's a, a photo of the, the, the first cohort team uh, and Elma at the front there with her socks duly knocked off, although you can't actually see them due to the seating arrangements. This slide is a, a, a summary of the first six uh, Chi Sigma projects and it just gives you a flavour of some of the, the improvement metrics around them. Uh, I don't intend to go through the details of each of them. Uh, but the, the main thing for me was that all of the projects deliver decent results. Um, and when we started this, we sort of asked uh, external experts about the expectation of delivery around this from other organizations. And the feedback we got was about 50% of projects would either fall through or fail to deliver. And I don't think that happens when you see the results. My, my own theory about why that uh, kind of happened is that in North Asia, 77% of our staff live locally. So both they, their families, and their relatives are using service services locally, and they genuinely care about service delivery. And they, and they themselves took the opportunity to scale up and do something themselves to improve things. So that investment uh, internally is a, is a real key part of this. I also think that the format and structure of a 12-week countdown, the availability of expert coaching during projects, and positive pressure of peers challenge in a mixed team really helps keep teams on course to that delivery. 
Going forward, so our focus now is more on financial realizable benefits, obviously, in this tough budget environment. So we started using a, a benefits tracker piece of software called Goss Engage. Uh, what that does is it maps out the as-is process as well as to be options and it provides full cost savings on each option so we get really good cost metrics around the difference that uh, our lean projects are making. In case you don't recognise this person, uh, this is Jack Welsh who was the Chief Executive of General Electric in America uh, and I picked some of uh, Jack's words of wisdom out because he really used lean as a big part of the improvement at General Electric and during his time as chief executive there, it was quite incredible, they show, showed a 40 times value growth of the company during his time and I think Jack still holds the record for the biggest ever exit package in America, he got a $417 million exit package, so there you go. Jack Welsh was a real leader around lean improvement and uh, he spent a lot of his time uh, visibly leading uh, lean projects and to make sure he then input them. And once when he was asked why did he spend so much time as chief executive on visibility around lean, and his answer was that it wouldn't just work with Fred from quality. So apologies to anyone listening who may be called Fred and who may hunt to work in quality. Um, some of Jack's thinking really resonated with me uh, and I'm just going to share some of that with you because uh, I think it's really important. What he says is you want people that grab ideas, that share them, that grow with them, that's what you want. You want culture that just first thirsts for them and doesn't care where they come from. The stripes on the shoulder don't determine the quality of the idea, the idea does. And he expands on this in another interview, what he says is, simply put, boundaryless thinking meant we were open to the best ideas and practices from anyway, anywhere. So I'm quite uh, attracted by this idea of a culture of boundaryless thinking, as in my experience, the biggest wins and ideas we've had at North Ayrshire have come from staff themselves. The converse to this is the, this picture here really gets across the reverse side of boundaryless thinking and the danger of the, as they say here, the highest paid person's opinion, sometimes called the hippo roar, sets the tone for how things are done. Or perhaps it should really be called the hippo roar. Or sometimes the full name for it is the highest paid person in the organization's opinion. But that an acronym doesn't work quite as well. If that does happen in an organization, for me, it will strangle innovation and creative thinking. And for me, the leadership role within organizations is to create the culture and the conditions where ideas and innovation can thrive. So remember Jack's boundaryless ideas thinking. The only hierarchy should be in the idea itself, not who suggested it. I put this up because it was just reflecting when I, when I started this presentation, it was about uh, impact and involving staff and one of our aims was to increase, uh, increase employee involvement and participation in change. We've actually had some update figures since December 2015 that show further improvement um, and as an organisation we've still got a long, long way to boundaryless thinking but uh, we think we're on the right track in how we involve staff in change. In summary, it's important to reflect because we've change things as we've gone, we, we certainly didn't get it right first time and we've listened to our staff and, and uh, revised and refreshed as we've done various cohorts. Uh, after each Chi Sigma round, well, we have what we call a wash up meeting with all of the teams that have been involved to learn and refine and improve as we go. And this is a very important part of our approach as we have made a few boo-boos at the start and changed tack as we learn things such as the evaluation criteria. Some of that feedback, for example, was that some of our senior champions were also kindly described as variable, which really was a euphemism for absent. So Elma has now built in what the Midway Tollgate review, where that senior manager sponsor comes to the CNT and gives a short update on progress and is tested on their knowledge and the support they're giving around the project. What staff did say about the feedback about what worked well was having Elma as the chief exec closely involved throughout was really, really important and staff said that they felt that that meant their work was valued and that it was important. It was also important that we had the right training and further support for them to take that theory into practice and also having a mix of teams for peer challenge and keeping that fast pace on projects. One of the things we didn't get right as well was 
the first cohorts was we didn't capture the stories well enough uh, and, uh, and communicate them throughout the organisation. There was a lot of staff interest after the first cohort and particularly Elma at various uh, leadership conferences etc. started to mention lean and staff were asking well, what's that all about. So now what we do is we capture the, the projects and video stories and we put these on our intranet. We also have a YouTube channel at North Ayrshire. You can see some of the Chi Sigma videos there. There's a, there's a really good summary one that's about three and a half minutes. And we also sell the story internally, uh, including updating to our elected members. So it's a real cultural uh, way of working for us. In terms of where we are now and where we're going, um, We've now got internally trained, uh, which is a really cost-effective way of doing it, over 80 green belts, as well as having that strategic champion training. But we've also made a conscious effort to put hundreds through the introduction to Lean so that all teams can really understand what's going on and contribute to this. So we want to make it a real cultural thing. So uh, that's been a big part of that as well. We're currently working through a series of short, sharp Kais and Blitz exercises as what we want is change capacity across a range of projects, whether it's one day, 10 day, 100 day, or up to the more complex projects of 10 months or a year. And long term success for us is that we're gradually building internal capacity so that lean and agile ways of working are culturally embedded in services as just the way we do things. So this is very much about a bridge from classroom into doing that. We're also trying to expand and trial wider ways for staff to raise ideas and suggestions, just to empower them to get on with changes themselves. So as a finale, this is really what we call our showy office slide. Um, I'm very proud of the team I've got, uh, especially as during 2015 we won five national awards, including the Scottish Business Excellence Award for Lean, the HR Network Awards for Best Workplace and Employee Engagement Award of the Year the Guardian Newspaper Award for Organisational Culture, as well as the Personnel Today Award for Excellence in Public Service HR. And what was particularly pleasing uh, to me was that purposely, virtually all these awards were in direct competition with large commercial private sector organisations. So we did make a point of testing what we've been doing against uh, large companies to see if it, it matched up. This slide is really when we let our hair down a bit. This photo is uh, from the HR Network Awards last year. If any of you were there, it was a fantastic night. Uh, and that's my team. From the left to right is Fiona, myself, Jackie and Ainsley. Um, Graham, uh, who leads the change team, just joined the team later. But frankly, he would have spoiled that photo, so he wasn't in it. Um, I really liked this photo until I was told by someone the other day that I reminded them of Bosley from Charlie's Angels. But I remember him as the fat guy from Charlie's Angels. Um, but my team do seem to run very well in Prosecco. So that's really all I've got to say. Uh, it hopes you give gives you a sense of uh, the approach we've used, which is really combining the investment and training and the skills, but also it's the way that it gets done. I think that's really the the secret sauce of doing that. So many thanks for listening today and I'm going to hand back to David and I think uh, there may be some questions. Thank you very much Gavin. Um, have we just used the box the, on the drop down menu, um, just a small grey box on your screen just to ask questions um, and also indicate if you've got access to a microphone while you do that. Our first question is um, how many of the North Ayrshire Council projects are completed in 12 weeks? We've only had uh, one that's gone beyond that. They, they are all purposely done in that 12 week period, uh, but for reasons one of them didn't. But we, we have it booked in with the Chief Executive at that 12 week point, so it is delivered within the 12 weeks. Thanks Gavin. Um, next question from Karen McDermott. Um, what is the question? What is the engagement of councillors been like? I think it's it's been gradual. Uh, at first, it was different language to them, and they didn't know what it was about. Um, but we've tried to include them in it, um, and we do a lot of updates with them now about uh, lean and what we're doing. So it's become part of the language, even for elected members, um, particularly when they they can see the reaction of the staff. I mean, th this is something that's really staff led. You know, we have. Uh, like the green belt training has a waiting list, but it's it, it it's staff you know telling the stories about that, so they tell the stories to elected members as well. So it it really becomes sort of self-sustaining. 
Thank you. Um, our next question is from Carolyn Chalmers. Um, how many projects are ongoing at the same time? We, the first year we ran five, and then I went back and did the children's services one that we kind of made a boo-boo on. Uh, then we did seven, so we've kind of escalated it, but we're running a whole series of uh, Kai Sigma, uh, Kai's and Blitz uh, at the moment. So corporately we kind of whittled down. Most years it's sort of 16, 17 original pitches, but we can handle about six or seven corporately uh, and give the support to that and do the day of success. But then we, we do come back to some of the other projects and do them offline. As I say, some of the staff have gone through the cycle of Kai Sigma projects are just up and running with the projects that were left, as it were, on the shelf. So um, th there's a lot of services that are just getting on with things. Um, the next question is, um, you mentioned that senior managers are kept up to date with the projects. How do staff find out about the projects in the day of success, and how are projects selected? Well, projects are selected by staff themselves. You know, it's it is peer pitch. We, we we ask them. They come along to our pitch day um, in groups, and they they have like an elevator pitch with a short, sharp presentation of what their pitch to do a lean project's about, and they use that simple evaluation to whittle that down. So, I don't get involved in that. That really is staff led about which ones uh, are chosen to go forward. Um, what was the second part of the question, David? Um, the full question is, how do staff find out about projects in the day of success, and how are projects selected? Well, pro projects are selected, I say, is by peer pitch selection. Um, how do staff find out about it? Well, we video it all, and we also do updates uh, with staff at various points. We do. Um, we have a staff magazine. Uh, we have the YouTube channel, so we put the videos in there. Because I say the first year we did it, we didn't get that right at all, uh, and we had a lot of staff asking, "What, what is this, and what's it about?" Uh, and we really missed a trick. So the day of success this year, um, it didn't cost a lot. I got someone local; it was about three hundred pounds to video it, but that's made a big impact. That the staff are able to see that uh, and um, find out more what it's about. Also, after the presentation of the day of success to the senior leadership team, we did an open one for staff. So they did another run round, so a lot of staff came and saw uh, the actual day of success, if you like, a, a second run of that. So but sh sharing the stories is really important now. I think that's something that we've had to evolve uh, and put on YouTube and share and staff magazine, etc. So just um, do you do this one service at a time then, Gavin, or do you, or would you? Um, you mentioned. Do, sorry, do we do what? Would you do it like service at a time? You mentioned that you did children and uh, children services there. Would you move on from one service at a time, or would uh, for the twelve week cycle, or, or is it? No, it's it's just one project pitch uh, yeah. that goes forward. It's not particularly by service. Most of the groups are pretty mixed. Um, that's really part of it as well that they can ask the the Afladi questions. So it's by the merit of the idea. You know, they they, they come together. Self-evaluate that with a very short pitch, you know, no more than five minutes. This is what what I want to do. This is a process that's frustrating me, and then they kind of say, well, what, what's the customer benefit? What's the impact? What's what do we get out of it? So, this is very organic. It's very staff-led, and that's why I say my role over time is is really just to keep the energy going and support it. Sure. So, the next question is from Isabel McClellan. Um, what's involved in the Green Belt training, and who provides this? It's a week of training, uh, and we do that internally in, in our own headquarters here at Kyingo House. Um, we did a tender for that, so it's a proper structure, comparable green belt training to commercially. Um, we found that a more, far more cost-effective uh, way to do it because you can. There's a number of organisations in Scotland that will do it off the shelf, but it's quite expensive. So we did a tender for that and, and run. As I say, we're now over 80, so we try to keep the groups fairly, I think the maximum would be about 8 or 10 at a time, and uh, we do it in-house. So it's a five-day, they're, they're doing the full lean techniques and tools, the full domain cycle, so they have the theory, they have the, the training, but we also use the external expert that provides that as the coach facilitator when they're live to to 
when they're when they're taking these tools and techniques for the first time in a live service situation, they can draw on that support. And as I say, some do it very lightly because they're quite confident, and others, you know, they get more support. But it's it's just to act as a support bridge from when they walk out that classroom, having done the green belt, to live situation of doing it in a service. Thanks, Evan. Uh, next question is from David Brown. What is the average amount of time that each staff member of of teams have to give to Lean Project? Oh, totally varies. Totally varies. So, I mean, even within teams, some of them naturally, inevitably, are doing far more than others. It's it's not a perfect science. Um, part of the senior sponsor's role is to make sure that they do get some space and capacity to do this. So there is a acknowledgement right across the, the all of the senior leadership team that we have to support this because otherwise they're spending their time, as I say, that catch-22 of they're soaked up with things that are frustrating and wasting time. So it is something that we have discussed and decided as a leadership team to clear the road to a degree. Uh, but they're still doing their, mainly doing their day-to-day -day jobs. To be honest with you, a lot of them do things at night and in their own time at weekends. So they are quite uh, passionate about doing it and getting to it really well. But um, they have a senior sponsor, and that's why Elma uh, started the, the, the midpoint one, just to make sure they were doing that role, because some of them didn't. They were absent. Um, some of them were great. And that's why they said it was variable. So there is a prod point midway that uh, they're almost quite good at saying, you know, are you giving the right support? Are you giving the space? How are they getting on? So there is a checkpoint that, that, that they have the, the space to do this. Um, so the next question from Kate Lackey sort of links to the last one from Isabel. Um, how did you prioritize who to train first for Greenbelt training? Uh, we, well, we didn't. It was, it was a bit random. To be honest with you, until we started to get into the projects and we realised we had gap areas, so we did catch up uh, to make sure that we had capacity in all of our directorates because some of them hadn't been involved in it in the first cycle, the first cohort. But when they started to hear the impact, and particularly when their uh, senior leaders came and saw the presentations, they wanted this. So. Um, we have very good coverage now across directors, but we purposely make sure we've got capacity uh, right across education, health and social care partnership, all the main directorates, uh, so they can tap into that. Thanks, Gavin. Um, how did you originally, uh, this one's from Paul Whit Whitham, um, how did you originally introduce Lean to any North Fairsell Council senior, executive, senior executives and members to get buy-in? I first introduced it because um, I've had probably a bit of a haphazard career doing different things between private sector and public sector, but mostly change. Um, I'd used Lean in a private sector setting way back in the late 90s when I worked at Edinburgh Airport as an operational manager. Um, when I came to my role at North Eastern Council, one of the things I wanted to do, uh, I was head of HR and OD, was to integrate our um, HR resources team with the payroll team, and I wanted to use a Lean approach to do that, uh, and we just didn't have lean capacity in-house. In fact, it was really like a different language. Um, so I used it within my own service area, a lean approach, to make changes, and when people saw the impact, uh, it kind of get, gets momentum. I, I think, uh, and having the conversations with the senior team about um, how we do that was really important, and Elm was very keen as well that we, we trust and empower staff to do the change. So it fitted, the timing fitted as well doing this, that we invested in staff because we had a build up of results which gave confidence that this was the right thing to do. And that's why when we did, after we'd done the first big cohort and you could see the results uh, from the slide that I, I gave you, it became self-sustaining. You know, people were attracted to it. We don't have to push it. It's something that people, that's very much staff led that they want to do. They speak to their colleagues. They want to do the training, and a lot of people want to do something about processes that have been bugging the life out of them for years. Thanks, Gavin. Um, the next questions: How do you evaluate any key questions? How do I what? How do you evaluate? Um, I imagine its impact of projects, etc. 
Do you have any key questions that you would uh, regularly use? Well, I mean, as part of the lean approach, we are looking for the impacts and the metrics out of it. So we evaluate it um, both in the, the, the process improvements and the number of steps, the, the financial savings, but also in the, the soft benefits as well, because some of them are about uh, customer experience. Um, some of them are about reputation of the service. So we have a, a range of uh, sort of realizable benefits that, that demonstrate um, whether they've been effective or not. But in this context, we're going forward, is that we, we are becoming more focused on the financial realizable benefits. And that's why you know, the, the first cohorts were, were probably more about just making it successful. Some of the, the gains, the efficiencies were just absorbed within the services. But, but I wasn't bothered about that because it was, it was making a success. But as we've gone on and uh, we have more staff doing this and they're working in services day to day, it becomes more embedded then that's where we're trying to up the ante on particular processes that will deliver financial savings that we will take as realizable savings. So we've trialed out the, the GOSS Engage software, which gives that very clear metrics when we map out the current process, the as is, and then we look at the 2B options and we can get some really good uh, clear cost metrics. Um, so that's just where we're at, at the moment, that we're really trying to, to do things that will save us money. Um, our next question is back to David Brown. Um, what was the name of the financial benefits tractor software that you use? Goss Engage. I mean, I can send you a link to you, David, if you want. We 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 just sort of trialled it uh, recently, and uh, we've used it in a number of directorates, particularly Blade, uh, Place Directorate, when they've been doing a lot of projects, and it it works really well as a a discussion tool when they're mapping it out. So it's not just a sort of behind the scenes technical tool. And it also gives you the, the, the clear cost metrics because you can put in all the process steps, the timing, the staff grades and, and costs, etc. And it gives you a, a clear overview. But it's a, it's a pretty good tool. It's not that expensive, uh, but it's becoming more and more important to us because it, it gives you the clear steer on financial gains. Thanks. And uh, just a final question for today is back to Karen McDermott, um, who's wondering if you can come to Inverness on the 20th of September to present to the redesign board. <laughs> I've no idea. I can't see my diary. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so. I, I'm happy to have conversations with people. We've had a number of uh, organisations come and have conversations with them. We had the uh, Falkirk Council sharing ideas. It's more a conversation because there's different ways of doing this. and. You know, this is just our, our approach. It works for us because it's a cultural fit. Uh, you need the right leadership for this. You know, Elma is our secret sauce. You know, I don't think it's kind of like uh, Jack Welsh. Would it work as well without her? Probably not. But um, she is a big part of it. But it's a cultural way of working for us that really has had an impact. Okay. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, that seems to be all the questions for now. Um, what we'll do is, um, this was a recorded session, so uh, following the webinar, we'll send out details of how to access the recording as well as the slides that were used today. And I'll also leave with Gavin to uh, pull together some of the resources that have been mentioned, particularly in the question and answer session, and send them out to everybody yeah. who registered or attended the webinar today. Um, just finally, before we finish off, um, I'm just going to do a little bit around the Change Managers Network that this series is a part of. Um, we exist mostly as a knowledge hub group and you're welcome to join. Um, the initially membership was limited to local government, now we operate all across the public sector in Scotland and in some cases across the wider UK. Uh, it's basically a forum where we do all our you'll see that we've got our details of our webinars and details of events on and also a forum where you can share ideas plus we also share all the recordings from the webinars on this and um, finally I, just to round up there will be a short survey that follows this if you could complete that out and just give us some ideas for future webinars and also give some feedback for Gavin then that would be great uh, once again I'd like to thank Gavin for giving up his time to present today and I hope you all enjoyed the session thank you very much uh, thanks very much, folks. It was a pleasure.